Uh, I'm just excited about what God's doing in our church. We want to welcome you to Grace and Bible Baptist Church this morning. And uh, we have a very special guest here this morning. Uh, Brother Jeff Copes uh, is not only the executive uh, vice president of Heartland Baptist Bible College and uh, wears a lot of hats uh, and does a lot of things there at Southwest and at the college, uh, but also he is a family friend for a long, long time. Uh, Brother Jeff has been a, a very close friend to our family. And uh, what I like about him the most, uh, which I was trying to think this morning what it is I like about him. No, just kidding. But uh, what I like about him the most is his servant's heart. Brother Copes will actually do anything for you that he can do to help you get closer to the Lord or advance the cause of Christ. And let me tell you, that is a rarity in our society today, somebody that is willing to absolutely do anything to help you and to be there for you. And I really appreciate the friendship uh, that we have with Brother Copes and his wife, but also I appreciate his ministry. And he's going to come and preach uh, the Word of God to us this morning. So you give him a good Grace and Bible Baptist welcome as he comes, Brother Jeff Copes. Praise the, praise the Lord. I enjoyed the service already this morning, the congregational singing and, and the offertory. Man, I wish he'd get a little bit more excited on that piano. That was excellent. I really enjoyed that. And uh, the young people did a great job as well. Uh, this morning, I'm going to preach, and then uh, this evening as well. And uh, I want to encourage you to, to come back tonight. Uh, I'm going to preach on leadership. And, uh, you know, that's a topic that uh, a lot of people are talking about. But we're going to talk about leadership this evening. We're going to look into the Bible and to find out what the Bible says about not just leadership, but biblical leadership. Because you just don't want to be a leader depending upon how the, word de the world defines it. You want to look at how the Word defines leadership. So I want to encourage you to come back. And then tomorrow night, I know that it might be deemed as the uh, missions uh, candidate school kickoff meeting. But um, I want to, I know your preachers already mentioned it. I want to encourage you to come back tomorrow night to encourage these missionaries. And I'm going to be preaching on conflict resolution. Uh, within relationships, you might say, well, to missionaries, yeah, missionaries have conflicts. <laughs> and, uh, and then I would say this in general, if you want to have a relationship that currently has a conflict and you want to know how to biblically resolve that conflict, come back tomorrow night, biblically, a biblical resolution to conflicts. Now, if you don't care about your relationships, then just stay home tomorrow night, okay? But honestly, I, I really encourage you to do that. Um, tomorrow night will be really the biblical aspect of conflict resolution. And then Tuesday afternoon, I'm going to be preaching on finances to the candidates, missionary candidates. And um, from what I understand, the church would be invited to that too. We're going to be talking about budgeting, financing, and then investing as well. That will be Tuesday afternoon. I look forward to it. Glad to have my wife, Pam, here, always with me. And the friendship that we have with the Websters is now long. Uh, and it is one that we have enjoyed for a long time, and we love them to death. We really do. I want you to think of this. How can this church, we'll make it very specific, cope with the woke attitude that's out there? How do you cope? That almost rhymes. It's almost like a little rap, isn't it? How do you cope with the woke? <laughs> that's as close as I get to rapping right there. But cope with the woke. How do you do that? Well, the Bible gives us an idea, and I want to draw your attention to Titus. We're going to look at a couple of chapters here in Titus. And if you would, you would look at Titus chapter 1, and I want you just to have the background here. This is the older preacher, the Apostle Paul, writing a letter to the younger preacher, Titus. So this isn't written to us, but it's written to a preacher of a New Testament Independent Baptist Church. It's written to Titus, but it has been preserved all these years without any mistakes for us to learn from as New Testament believers. And so let's keep that in context. And so Titus is there on this island in his Crete, and Crete would be a place that would be wicked. I would say this, whatever they wanted to do, they did. And they didn't do it privately. They did it publicly. If you think that we have a crazy society going on today and like this is brand new, that's what was happening in Crete. It's very, very similar to what's happening across our land even now. So Titus is now, has this letter from Paul, the older preacher again to the younger preacher. 
And I just want you to look at verse 3. It says, Paul says, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is, look at this, committed unto the, me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Then he says, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every day as I had appointed thee. So for the next few verses, Paul helps Titus, the younger preacher, on how to set things in place, how to set things in order with the leadership of the church. And he says this in verse 6, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but the lover of hospitality and a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, and temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. And then he starts to talk about those that are unruly, those false teachers. And he goes into this now, changing from setting in order the church leadership. Now he's going to talk to, talk to Titus about those that are there in Crete, those that are there in the churches around Crete that are false teachers. He says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars. Wow. Evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and the com and commandments of men that turn from the truth unto the pure. All things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Then he says this. Now, you remember, this is the older preacher telling the younger preacher how to handle, how to set things in order with the leadership of the church. And then he tells them how to handle the false teachers. This is what he says. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being an abominable and disobedient, and that every good work reprobate. That's what Titus is hearing from Paul on how he should handle setting things in order, I'm being repetitive on purpose, and to handle false teaching. Really, in the sense, we can see that's for the preacher right there. But in chapter 2, he addresses the whole church. He addresses the young and the old. I mean, look at it right there in chapter 2, verse 2. It says that the aged men... The aged men. I want to try this morning to encourage everybody, the aged men and, and all the others. Well, it's an aged man. Well, I would just say this. If you're 40 or plus and you're a male, you're an aged man. You're an old guy. <laughs> We're going to see four groups of people addressed here in this passage in chapter 2. You're going to see it broken down into basically male and female because that's all we have is male and female. Can I get an amen? amen. He's going to address the males and he's going to address the females. And he's going to address, you can see it there in verse 2, the aged men. And I'm going to just say if you're over 40, you're an aged man. And then in verse 3, look at it. In verse 3 it says the aged women. I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about how old that is. You decide. <laughs> but we have two groups. We have the aged men and the aged women. We also have male and female here. And then look at verse 4, that they may teach the young women. So now we have three groups, the aged men, the aged women, and now young women. And look at verse 6, young men, young men. We have all four groups right here in this passage 
that Paul is telling the younger preacher that is pastoring in this crazy situation called Crete, where there's anything that you want can be available. And anything you want to do that brings pleasure to you is done publicly on the street. That's the scene. That's the backdrop to this. It must have been a crazy society where anything was passing as acceptable. Okay. So what's a church to do? How do you cope with that? Well, let's look at chapter 2, and we'll, we'll focus there, and we'll just have a word of prayer now, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, there seems to be a, an openness here this morning to hear from your word. And Lord, we only have reason to believe that when we come to hear, Lord, with an open heart, you will meet with us. So, Lord, would you not help me today in the preaching? Because I'd like to have nothing to do with this rest of this service. I'd like to have nothing to do with it. Lord, would you do with the rest of the service as only you would do, as only you could do, so you could be praised? Would you do with your people this morning what only you can accomplish? We ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's look at chapter 2. It says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. He's telling the preacher to preach sound doctrine. He's telling them this is how you preach to these categories of people in this day and age. So you might find yourself even here this morning saying, Boy, all that we ever hear around here in Sunday school class and from our preacher is a bunch of doctrine. That's right. That's what the Bible tells a preacher to do, is to preach not just doctrine, not his doctrine, but sound doctrine. And he's to teach it to the, the aged men. It says in verse 2 that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity, and patience. And it goes on teaching sound doctrine that the aged women, likewise, they should be like what we just listed there in verse 2, but... That, excuse me, that they may be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. This is what Paul is telling the younger preacher to teach to the aged women and the aged men. We might say, why should the aged women be taught these things? Verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet chaste, keepers at home, good and obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men, there's our second, our fourth group, likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. And then he gives us another category. He gives the servants, and he talks about those servants, those would be employees, exhort servants to be obedient under their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering them again. He's saying to the preacher, encourage your, the people to be good employees, to be good hard workers. But we have to say this, there's a lot of hardworking people at various places of employment. But the Christian is challenged, and look at it there, not to answer again. That means this, we as born-again Christians, as workers, we aren't to talk back to our boss. That should be the difference. There's a lot of good working people alongside of you, but we should be the ones that don't answer again. Not purloining, verse 10, but showing in all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Did you see that? Adorn the doctrine of God. 4, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. How do we cope with this woke society? Let's go back to verse 2. We have the aged men, verse 3, we have the aged women, verse 4, we have the young women, 
Verse 6, we have the young men. And there's a list there. You read it along with me. But did you notice what word appears for all four groups? Look at it. Verse 3, verse 2. The aged men be, what's that next word? Sober. Look at the aged women. The aged women in verse 3, skip down to verse 4, are to teach the young women to be what? Sober. And verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober. See, there's the common thread that's there for each category. So no matter what group you are in this morning, you have seen right here in the New Testament that we are to be sober-minded. No matter if you're male or female, young or old, we are to have a sober way about life, meaning we're not to be living just based upon mere passions and emotions. We are to be living a life with temperance, with a purpose, with seriousness. We are to be silly. We are to be swayed with the wind. We are to live a life soberly. It isn't just the fact that the sheer surface level of the word sober means you're not to be intoxicated. No, we are to live a life purposefully based upon sound doctrine. If you want to know how to fight the society, we don't sit there and we don't have to create a whole revolution ourselves, but we are to live a life based upon sound doctrine, soberly living upon sound doctrine. If you want to know how to handle everything that comes your way, whether it's, a, it's an attack uh, mentally or physically or even in relationships, we are to live a life soberly based upon sound doctrine. We are to live a life based upon passions that we just react to this and react to that in emotional. No, we are to live a life soberly based upon sound doctrine. If you want to know how to change and influence your neighbor and your family members and the people in society, we don't have to necessarily run into a picket line, but we need to live a life based upon sound doctrine, adorning the doctrines of Jesus Christ. That's how we live in this type of society. We are to live soberly with temperance. We'll talk about the old, the aged first. The aged men, the old guys, I am one now. I can remember when my parents became managers of a trailer park down in Florida. We lived in a trailer park, and we lived right down on the Indian River on the intercoastal there. And there's a shuffleboard court there, and then there's a boat dock. And I can remember just maybe the first week I was there, I, I just noticed all the old guys gathered down at the fishing dock at 7 a.m. Two guys first. Same two guys. They showed up at 7 a.m. Each had their fishing rod, a little bait bucket, and they baited their hooks, and they threw it in there, and they sat down on the bench. And then about 7.30, eight more guys showed up. You know what they did? They came down and watched the two guys. And they sat down on the other benches and watched these two guys who were just sitting on the bench. And even if something got on their hook, those two guys just sat there, and they kept on talking. You know what they were doing? Lingering. They weren't fishing. They were lingering. You know what they were doing? Just hanging out. Do you know what I find in Scripture? Aged men just don't hang out when it comes to God's work. When I was pastoring some of the aged men, you know what I learned quickly into life as a brand new pastor? Some of those old guys knew how to fix anything. When things got broke, they didn't say, let's go buy a new one. They just said, we can fix that. Yeah. I learned that the aged men can be good, helpful visits. Well, I can remember going to the hospital a couple of times and had one of the aged men with me. He just brought a, a sense of calmness to it. Go to the hospital with him and maybe be going visiting somebody, a young family just had a tragedy happen physically. And that old man would say, you know, I remember when this happened to my sister. And he'd talk about a story. I can remember the old men being coming up to me at the age of 35 and saying, Preacher, I just want to be able to be an encouragement to you. And then saying this, what can I do for you? I can remember the aged ladies. We started off with five little ladies. That's all we had at first in our church. I can remember one of them coming up during the invitation time. And you might say, you had invitations? Says, we had invitations with five. <laughs> it was awesome, to be honest with you. I can remember Miss Florine coming up. She had the shakes. She'd come up and she'd grab my hand. I remember this one particular time, not long into the pastor, and she says, Pastor, I just want to let you know I pray for you every morning. 
but especially on Sundays when you get in the pulpit. They weren't lingering. When that church was without, was, was without a pastor, a church pastor, a pastor of a church down the street, it was a full square, full apostolic church. It was a four square church is what they would call themselves. And that pastor came down on a Sunday morning with just these five little ladies in this little Baptist church. They came down and he walked in. He said, ladies, I'm so-and-so. And they said, we know who you are, Reverend. It's a small town. And he says, my church has voted that we want to come down and just take you ladies in and be a part of our membership. And we'll take over the building. We'll take over all the maintenance. And we'll just absorb you right into our church membership. I'll become your new pastor, ladies. What do you think? And that same lady, Miss Florine, said, Reverend, while she's alive and she's alive and she's alive, you'll never get this Baptist church. Amen. She wasn't lingering. She was hanging on and keeping that church alive and open until God led a man there. Yeah. In the depths of my heart, there's a place called Meadowview Baptist Church. And you'll never erase those memories from my mind. Not because of the building. Not because of the size of the crowds, but because the five little widow ladies that encouraged this preacher, that whenever he mounted the pulpit, in their mind, they wanted it to get on fire. Amen. Age ladies, you may think you have nothing to do with the future of this church. You have much to do with the future of this church. Amen. You might not be able to walk up and down these stairs like you used to be able to. You might not be able to grab a vacuum cleaner like you might want to. You might not be able to do all these other things, but you can pray right. for your preacher and your preacher's wife. Aged men, you have a task. You might be in retirement age. You might be nearing retirement age. And it might be that that's all your focus right now. I would say, what will you do with, with your extra time for Jesus when you retire? For the Lord. Yeah. Um, I'm convinced that the men from Meadowview Baptist Church that were in retirement age, it was honestly, Brother Roy, it was like having a couple of them on staff. It was incredible. I was bivocational for all of those years as a pastor. And I had these men that would come and be at the church throughout the week, and I wasn't even able to be there myself. It was wonderful. But the aged men are also supposed to teach the young men on how to be sober. You just don't be a blessing to your pastor, aged men, aged ladies. You are to teach the younger generation. Ladies, what do you think the young ladies of, of this church could learn from Hollywood that would be godly? I don't think a thing. What could, what could the young ladies of this church learn from contemporary television or contemporary movements about how to conduct a church service? No, they won't. What, where can a young lady go to to discover what it's like to really love your husband, love your children, uh, to be hospitable? Where do they learn all that? You know where they would go most of the time? Google. But you ladies have a task, according to the word of God, that your preacher is to teach you that you older ladies, aged ladies, are to teach the younger ladies. You're to teach them how to live a, a holy life, how to live a sober life, not based upon emotions and passions, but to live a sober life based upon sound doctrine. You are to be adorning sound doctrine in your walk with God so that the younger ladies of this church, they don't have to Google anything. They get it right from the ladies of this church. Each and every time they see you here Sunday morning, they see you here Sunday night, they'll see you here tomorrow night, they'll see you here Wednesday. The younger ladies know that if you're going to be a lady, a Christian lady, you need to be at church. And you can do that, ladies, just by being an example, by being in your place. 
When this church comes together, yes, there's fun and there's fellowship, but you are supposed to assemble. That means that you are to come together. Different parts of the body come together, not for fellowship only, but to do something. Because when you assemble different parts of something, you're putting together something to get something accomplished. When parts from a bicycle all come together and they get assembled, somebody gets moving. And you are to assemble. This is not a cruise ship here in the middle of south central Texas. This is a battleship for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the older ladies have to teach the younger. And those that would say, I'm younger, I'd say this, and there's somebody younger than even you that's watching you. If you're here in high school, there's a junior higher watching you. If you're a junior higher, there's an elementary kid watching you. If you're a young married, there's a brand new newlywed couple watching you. And the old men to teach the young men how to live a life soberly. You know, how do you do that? Well, let's just take this scene. It's not written to us, but it's written and preserved for us. It's written back in a time where Titus was the pastor there in Crete. So it's a past letter, but look now at verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. See, what's true here that Paul is writing to Titus, it's true in this present world. We are still to live a life based upon sound doctrine. We are to live soberly by being sober, basing our life on sound doctrine. Let's stop getting mad at the unbeliever and the world and all the woke movements, but let's just give them something to look at and to say, that's sound doctrine. That's something based upon something that is worth looking into. But how do you do this? How do you live a life presently in a sober way based upon sound doctrine? How do you do that? Verse 3, here's the how-to looking for that blessed hope <laughs> and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purity unto himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. You want to know how to live a life soberly in this present world? We need to look to this sheer fact as a believer. Jesus Christ is coming back again. Instead of just us looking here temporally and thinking that, that what we have is all that we should look forward to. Listen, the house that we, we live in today will be somebody else's house pretty soon. The, the, the vehicle that we drive today will be in the junkyard soon. Uh, the cattle that you have today will be at somebody's hamburger tomorrow. Things are just all temporal. It's that simple. But we need to stop looking here. If you want to really live a life based upon sound doctrine and take your role as an aged man or an aged lady and a young lady and a young man seriously in the New Testament, you are to live a life soberly based upon sound doctrine. What is the way to do that? Here's the key. We need to stop looking here and look to there because Jesus who is there is going to be coming back one day soon. Amen. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ, based upon your study of Scripture, you believe that Jesus Christ could come back any day now? Say amen. amen. Good. It's pretty good. How many of you would say that based upon that, you would say with a raised hand, how many believe that Jesus Christ would come back again and you would just shout amen and raise your hand? I mean, that's just, that's big. How many of you, let's just do that. If you believe that Jesus Christ can come back any day now with a big amen, lift up your right hand. Amen. amen. Good, good. Nearly everybody did that. But if I added to the question now and I said this, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ could come back any day now and you shouted amen and you raised your right hand and then I said and added this, and how many of you would say that your lifestyle matches your theology on the return of Christ? Raise your left hand. That's a biggie, isn't it? So you would say that what you believe, that's your theology about the 
doctrine of the return of Jesus Christ, that's what you think, that's theology, you would say, yes, Jesus Christ can come back any day now. You'd, you'd just shout a good Baptist amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a Baptist preacher's button, and I admit it, and I love it. And you'd have your right hand up. And then I said, in all sincerity, how many of you would say your current lifestyle, the way you're living, matches your theology? Wow. That's a big one, isn't it? I think on Sunday morning, Brother Roy, I think we'd have a lot of people raising right and left hand. But Sunday morning doesn't last all day or all week. You're going to be out in the world tomorrow. But based upon Scripture, you and I are to be living a life adorning the sound doctrine of Jesus Christ. They should see us living a life where we really believe he's coming back again, and we believe it so much that it manifests itself out in our lives. It shows. Our inside belief shows outwardly. Today, we would probably all raise our right hand, kind of like a politician. You know? I'm sorry if you have any local politicians here. But if we did this, we raised our left hand and our right hand up, meaning that our Lifestyle, the way you live, matches your theology. Folks, this is a universal symbol for what? Surrender. Whatever war is going on in this world right now, if one side did this, they just surrendered. You want to know how to live a life, whatever category you're in, aged, young, or old, male or female, to live a life soberly? You're going to have to be surrendered to what? To the fact that he's coming back again. And he's going to come back, and in, and in my mind, I'll call it a rapture for a moment. We're going to get raptured out of here if death doesn't take you first. We're going to get raptured, lifted right out of here. And then at that point, then there's going to be a reckoning, a reckoning, a reconciling that Jesus himself will look over all that I've done for him. And just like you, there'll be a lot of stuff that we've done. But he's going to look at it, and he's going to look at all of it, and he's going to say, you did all that, but you didn't do all of that for me. Some of that stuff that you did, you did it for praise. You did it for people. You did it for this. And I'm not saying it's bad, applause is bad. I'm saying, but if that's why you did it, then you just got your reward. But if you did it to please God, to bring him glory, those are the things he'll reward you for. Can I ask you this? Are you ready for that? Are you ready for Jesus to reckon your life's accounts? You ready for that? Well, all that I know for sure is this. Because you're breathing right now, you have time to get ready for it. But if you just mess around with this as a believer, then that day that's out there, and the Bible calls it a great day. It could be a great, wonderful day for you. Or it could be a great day where a lot that you thought you were going to be rewarded for will burn up. You won't even enjoy for heaven. For eternity. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like I was. You sat in a church pew a long time. In my case, 20 years. I was I was a drug baby. My mother drugged me from church from day one. I <laughs> think from day one. So I was raised in a Baptist church. I would have been dressing just like any Baptist kid through my young days and through my high school days. And for 20 years, I learned how to do church. I just learned how to do church. We moved from Massachusetts to Florida after we graduated high school. So now at the ages of 18 to 20, I basically lived in Cocoa Beach on the weekends or Daytona Beach. I lived right in between the two 
cities, Cocoa Beach and Daytona Beach. Without getting into the details, I'll just let you hear this. At the age of 20, as a young single male, Cocoa Beach and Daytona Beach had nothing good. Nothing good. That was my life. And then on the third Sunday of February, 1983, God spoke to me at 11.30 at night, and he said, I'm sick and tired of you just playing. And this is your last and only chance to accept me as your Savior. That's what he told me in my mind. I was by myself. I got down off the couch, got on my knees, and I just started crying. My mom and dad were in bed. I just started crying. I just said, Lord, help me. Forgive me. I've messed up, God. I know you've given me a chance to get saved before, but God, would you save me tonight? I want to trust you with all I have, with all that I know, God. I want to trust you. I just want to have faith in you. I didn't have a Bible college degree. I didn't have knowledge at all. Do you think I paid attention in church for those 20 years? Oh, yes, maybe I warmed a pew for 20 years. I didn't pay attention. I knew very little about the Bible. But I knew this. I had conviction in my heart that this was it. This is the last chance. And I just asked God to forgive me of my sins. It wasn't a fancy prayer. It wasn't a big, long prayer. But it was a sincere prayer in my heart. I said, God, save me. I don't want to go to hell. I know things I've done have committed me to hell, but I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to be with you. Lord, help me. And I can remember just getting up off my knees. Different. I had long hair then. My hair didn't shed off or anything like that. No, it was a process. But positionally, my position in front of God changed. Instead of being rejected by God, I was now accepted by God. If you're here this morning and you've just learned how to do church, I'm begging you, stop it. Get saved. In a few moments, we're going to have an invitation. It's just an invite. It's going to be a call for, to believers that if God's been speaking to you as a believer, I'm not going to pussyfoot around this. If God's been speaking to you as a believer, there's only one thing to do. Speak back to God. Talk back to God. And if God's been speaking to you, then I would highly recommend that you separate out from where you are very comfortable on your pew and find a place down here at the front, maybe there at this pew, maybe here at the steps, wherever. There's a lot of people we can come up here on the platform and just talk to God. It's insane for a believer to hear from God and not to talk back with God. That doesn't make any sense at all. And so if you're a, a non-believer, if you're a guest here this morning, and you see a lot of movement, which you might see a lot of movement, I don't know what the believers will do, but if you do, what they're doing is they're coming down front to pray and to meet with God. Some of them will have a staff person that will go alongside them because maybe that person's come and said, would you pray with me about something? And if you're here this morning, and if you're a guest during this time of invitation, or if you're here this morning and you're not a guest, but you're a church member, and you know that you're lost, you know that you're just like I was, you've just been sitting in a pew, then would you please come down here and grab your preacher by the hand and say, preacher, help me, I need to get saved. Amen. And you might say, well, I don't want to get people mad at me. No one will get mad at you. <laughs> Heaven will rejoice. And your life will change. It does not matter what your last name is. Is your name written down in the book of life is what matters. And this morning, if you're here as a believer, and maybe there's some that, that aren't here right now, in your own family, and they're wayward. I would say this to you mamas especially. Don't you give up on your boy. Don't you give up on your daughter. I stand here today, humanly speaking, because I had a praying mama. 
Boy, she would smell it on me. She would have an idea of what I was up to. She knew people that were in my life. I'd come walking into that trailer sometimes, Brother Dick, and I'd hear my mother in the back room praying out to God aloud, praying that God would take people out of my life. And she would say this, God, do whatever you got to do to get her out of his life. I mean, she'd nearly pray a curse on somebody. <laughs> Mama, my mother would say to you, she's in heaven now. Don't you stop praying for your boy. Don't you stop praying for your daughter. Oh, they're already adults. My mom would say, so was mine. Yeah. Maybe you're here this morning. And that pew isn't like what it used to be. Then why don't you pray for those that are missing here today? Missing in action. Maybe you're here this morning. And you've just been given a, a visit with the doctor. And the doctor doesn't have good news for you right now. Can I just say this? There's good news up there because he's coming back soon. No matter what your situation is, if we will stop looking here, but look up there. And if you're a believer here this morning, I just have to ask you this final question. When was the last time that you just bent your knee and just thanked him for putting his back to the cross for you. When was the last time you just thanked the Lord for what he did for you?